Hello again. I completed the Brooklyn Half Marathon this past weekend, so just wanted to do a uh, race recap today. Here's proof. And the shirt. <laughs> so that's what uh, you get for running the race. Uh, but I ended up finishing in 136.35. So I ended up with a 723 average pace, which I was happy with on the day. I've done a sub 130 half marathon before, but I knew I wasn't going to be able to do it that day. Uh, the end of my training was a little bit rough. I had a back injury that I couldn't really get rid of for a couple weeks, so I had to reduce my mileage. And then I got a cold and it was hard to breathe. Uh, so the last couple weeks of training were not optimal, uh, but I did uh, put in a lot of t miles before that, so I felt prepared. A half marathon is, is a distance that I'm very comfortable with now. Uh, I can generally do it in between an hour and 30 to under an hour and 45 and I do a lot of runs and training of around that distance. So it's not a, a really taxing one for me from a mental standpoint, like a marathon is. But where I still find a half marathon to be challenging is holding that faster pace for a longer period of time. That's one of those things where I can do a sub seven minute pace for a half marathon. I have yet to be able to do that for a marathon. I'm, I'm hoping to get there. Uh, maybe next year, uh, I'll do the Suffolk County Marathon the end of this year, and I'm hoping to qualify for either Chicago or Boston at that race. And then uh, that's when I'll really try and put in a an excellent training plan and see if I can do uh, that speed at one of those bigger races next year. So I thought I'd kind of do a breakdown of that race uh, just for uh, educational purposes. So I ended up coming in uh, 2,536 out of about 25,000 and change. So top 10%, I'll take that. Uh, not bad for an old guy. Uh, for uh, my gender, uh, 2,131 out of about 13,000. Uh, 319 out of 1,900 for my age group. So it was a, it was a decent effort. I'm, I'm, I'm not upset about that. I, I have done better in the past, but on the day, I'm very happy with that. I was hoping for sub 140. I, feel, I felt like my fitness could handle that. I knew I wasn't going to get under 130, but uh, getting closer to 135 as opposed to 140, that was a, a good effort that day. I actually thought about bringing my GoPro, but it looked like it was going to be horrendous weather. It looked like it was going to be pouring rain and windy and cold. And I'm like, I don't really want to deal with trying to film and hold a camera when it's raining. It'll look terrible anyway. The lens will get all wet. Uh, but it ended up that I was in the early, uh, earlier wave. I was in uh, Corral B. So I started right at 7 o'clock, 7 a.m., and the rain really started. I finished around 8.38, you know, somewhere around that time, and it started to rain a little bit when I was finishing, and then on my drive home, it was pouring. So people that were in that second wave that started, they probably got absolutely soaked, but for me, I probably could have pulled off the GoPro, but it's another thing when you're running a race to, to think about and have to take out and deal with. Another thing you got to store on your belt or on your shorts somewhere. So I uh, uh, ended up not bringing the camera with me. So I don't have race footage for you, but I figure I'd go through the how the experience was for me. So first thing, as usual, Strava thinks I went a little bit longer than the race did. Uh, they had me finishing uh, with a 717 pace and going 13.25 miles, where the official obviously is 13.1. So that's something that I do find in most races. You end up usually running a little bit longer than the total distance of the course. Uh, one of that is GPS accuracy, and another reason is they measure all these courses cutting corners like exactly. So if you took a corner really wide and you did that multiple times, that's going to add on to your distance over the course of the race. So it always ends up being a little bit longer than the distance that they're claiming you're running. One pitfall that can happen with racing, which I know a lot of people are guilty of, is going out too hard at the beginning. This race, I was conscious of that and trying to make sure I didn't go out too fast. So I wanted to stay around seven minute mile pace. And if I needed to dr drift up, you know, if I got a little bit tired, I was willing to do that. So the first 5K was actually pretty good. I did a, a 707, a 705, and a 659. So that's really excellent. I was right on pace and uh, keeping my heart rate under 170. Again, I don't want to go over 177, 178. I get into the 180s, I'm not going to last, you know, at that heart rate. So if I can stay in the 160s or the low 170s, that's kind of the right place for me in a race where I can sustain that for a longer period of time. I talked in another video about knowing the course before you run the race, and I really didn't do that with this one. I didn't take my own advice. There's a couple decent hills in there that I was not expecting. Uh, you start out in Prospect Park, you run the first seven miles in the park before you get onto Ocean Parkway and then run down to Coney Island. So there was a couple pretty decent hills in there. So I was smart this time though and did slow down a little bit when I got to the hills so I wasn't blasting my heart rate up. But it was a little bit hillier than I expected. 
So my pace did drift up a little bit in the middle there. I had a 733, 740, 721, 730, 732, 730, but pretty consistently close to that 730, which is kind of like what my goal marathon pace is going to be in my next race, uh, 726. And then the end of this race was actually the best part to me. The last 5K felt really good. I felt a little bit tired in the middle, but then I kind of got a second win. It just felt smooth and uh, was really happy with the end of the race. I just kind of cruised to the finish, uh, 7.26, 7.15, and 6.51. So mile 13 was actually the fastest mile of the race for me, and I did have a sprint finish at the end. And that actually was pretty cool on the Coney Island boardwalk, uh, running on the boardwalk, sprinting over there. And it's always fun at the end of the race when you get to pass a bunch of people. It's like, all right, beating you, beating you, beating you, as opposed to you know falling apart at the end of the race and getting passed. So it's uh, it's always fun to be, be able to pace yourself correctly where you can turn it up at the end and finish strong. According to Garmin, my average pace was 7.17, during the race and I got up to 544 pace at the end when I was uh, sprinting to the finish. So respectable, I'll take it. My pace and heart rate were also pretty consistent throughout the race. Uh, looking at the graph here, uh, I stayed pretty much in that mid seven range most of the time, dipped up a little bit faster at points where it starts to get a little bit slower. That was actually at a few of the water stops. I didn't bring any hydration for me during this race. I don't feel that I really need to bring my own hydration for a half marathon. I did when I ran the New York City Marathon, but there's enough water stations that I stopped a few times and grabbed some Gatorade or some water. But uh, it also was, it was kind of humid but I didn't feel like I was sweating that much where I really needed to replace a lot of fluids. But where you see my pace dip a couple times there, I actually slowed down at the water stations. And I find, you know, you try and pinch the cup and sip it, but it ends up splashing everywhere. So I kind of got to a safe place and stopped for a second, chugged it, you know, and then kept going. So I find that to be more efficient than uh, spilling it all over me while I'm running. My heart rate average was 169 and pretty st pretty much steadily stayed 160s to 170 most of the race and it only tipped up over 180 at the end there where I was doing the sprint finish. So I did a good job of controlling my heart rate during this race. I also wanted to talk a little bit about the nutrition that I use when I race. I'm not sponsored by anybody. Still nobody really cares that I'm here. Thank you if you've liked and subscribed. If you haven't yet, uh, please subscribe. It'd be nice if I could get up to a thousand uh, subscribers and have you two care that I'm here one day. But uh, this is a uh, electrolyte drink that I use. Uh, it's called eFuel. And um, I don't, I'm not sponsored by them. I don't have any kind of referral link or anything like that. Actually, I do have a referral link uh, where it's like I get points if someone buys it. So it's, it's like referring you to Tesla or something like that. It doesn't really mean much. So I'll put that in the description. But if you want to pick up uh, eFuel, what I really like about this is it has complex carbohydrates. So it's kind of similar to UCAN, which is another really popular one that uses complex carbohydrates, but this is a lot less expensive than you can is, and it's all natural ingredients. So there's no artificial preservatives or coloring or anything like that in here. Uh, so they advertise this being very good for your stomach, preventing uh, gastrointestinal distress. Uh, I seem to have a really solid stomach though. Any kind of gel or drink I've taken has never really upset my stomach, but this one hasn't either. But I find this to be, this also is full of uh, vitamins as well as electrolytes. So they're trying to prevent muscle cramping and replacing that uh, salt that you're losing from sweat. So I actually did use this in, during the New York City Marathon. Uh, for that race, I drank this in the morning before I went there. So I was just topping off my electrolytes and my hydration before the race started. And I did use uh, two gels when I was there. Uh, E-Gel, this is the gel that's made by the same company. It's Crank Sports is the name of it. Um, and this is an electrolyte gel that has um, 150 calories per serving. A lot of gels have like 70. So what I like about this too is when I take one of these gels, it's almost like taking two. Uh, so it's, it's doing more... Uh, replacing more than a normal gel would. And again, this one has a lot of electrolytes in it. They put a little bit of sugar in there, but it's not based on sugar. It's mainly complex carbs, which is more of like a slow release uh, energy than like a sugar crash. Um, these also tend to be a little bit like salty, a little bit sour, but I actually kind of like that flavor. Uh, the cherry bomb of this is like really kind of sour, which I really enjoy. Kind of wakes you up uh, when you're when you're running for a while. And you put that in your mouth, you're like, oh man, all right. So uh, I like the cherry bomb flavor, but so far I've liked pretty much all the flavors from them. And another gel that I brought out for this one was uh, Science and Sport. This is their Double Espresso. Uh, so this actually has 150 milligrams of caffeine. So caffeine is one of those things where sometimes people use it in races, sometimes they don't. I've heard, you know, obviously it's a, it dehydrates you, so you're not supposed to take too much of it during a race. 
I've seen people that say you should take it later in the race rather than at the beginning to help prevent the dehydration. What I ended up doing in this race is I took one of these before the race started. So I kind of topped off my electrolytes and had a little bit of fuel in there uh, for the beginning of the race. And then I took two of these uh, caffeinated gels during the race. I took one at a half hour and one at an hour. And in the past, I've felt where the caffeine kind of works for you, especially if you don't drink coffee all the time. If you have one of these, you can sometimes get a bit of a rush and be like, all right, you know, you don't feel any pain and you feel great. But then eventually that does wear off. Uh, when I, I did take a few of these during the New York City Marathon, didn't feel it at all. It was so miserable. It was so hot. It was so humid. The caffeine didn't do anything. Uh, in this race, when I took the first one, I didn't really feel it. But when I took the second one about an hour in, then I had 300 milligrams of caffeine. And uh, that really kind of made me feel great towards the end of the race. I was able that last 5K, just cruise along, felt no pain, felt great. So I think the training really paid off and having that little extra caffeine boost at the end of the race helped me kind of go smoothly to the finish line. And the other big test that day was this was the first time I used the Hoka, Hoka, I used the uh, Hoka Rocket X2 in a race. And these were fantastic. I really enjoyed them a lot. Uh, they're kind of dirty on the bottom now, but still really no visible wear. Um, it's still, it was a little bit wet out there. These, these have decent rubber coverage. They're not the most grippy though. I did feel when it was a little bit wet, I was slipping a little bit, but not anything terrible where I'm going to fall over or anything like that. But sometimes when you're running fast and you put your foot down, you can kind of feel it move a little bit. So I was getting that a little bit in this shoe. So not completely grippy on a, on a wet course, but also not slippery, uh, in a bad way. So kind of, kind of middle of the road with grip. But for these, the rocker in these feels really nice. They're very smooth, very stable. I didn't have any issues with pronation during the race, especially later in the race. Sometimes I'll feel that right ankle kind of turning in a little bit. I didn't have that issue at all with this shoe. And it felt so great kind of barreling down that uh, boardwalk at the end in this shoe. Uh, when you turn up the pace in these, it really rewards you and feels great. Uh, the fit of it's also excellent. It's a little bit tight fitting shoe, but I find that these tighter fitting uppers really work well for me. There's not really any support in the heel, but same thing that uh, no supportive heel with the with the pads on the side like the Vaporfly. That actually, my foot just gets in here perfect. I tie it once, no lace pressure. I never have to readjust the laces. You just set it and forget it. So really enjoyed the performance of this shoe on that race. It was between that shoe and the Adios Pro 3 for what I was gonna wear, but I wore these for the New York City Marathon. I kind of wanted to give the Hoka a shot since that's the new, uh, the new shoe to see how it would compare and I really did enjoy it in that race. I have to do some more testing where I wear these two right after each other to kind of see how they feel but I find with the Hoka it feels a little bit more stable. It feels a little bit softer. Uh, there's a little bit more bounce from the Hoka. This shoe's a little bit more responsive. That light strike foam isn't as soft so it kind of gives you a little bit more propulsion. This shoe's a little bit stiffer than the Hoka as well so I feel like this shoe feels a little bit more propulsive. Uh, it might be better for me for a marathon because that stiffness is going to kind of hold that propulsiveness for longer. But now I kind of really need to see where the Hoka fits in in shorter races as well. I'm definitely going to try that for some 5Ks and 10Ks and see what kind of speed I'm able to get over a shorter distance. But for a half marathon, it did feel excellent. One other thing I wanted to mention, I wore the uh, Open Run by Shox for the race. And these are by far the best headphones for racing. I really enjoy wearing these for racing. What was really nice in that race is when you're running, you hear your music, but your ears are completely open to the outside sound. So you can hear people running by you, you can hear footsteps. But what was really cool is when we got to sections of that course where there were a lot of spectators or people making noise or playing music live, you can't hear this music anymore because all that other sounds coming into your ears. So you don't have to turn it up or turn it down or anything. As I'm running by an area where people are cheering, I can hear them all cheering. And then uh, once I get past that area, I hear my music again. So that was actually cool because that was the first time I've run a race wearing these where you could actually hear, you know, when the sound gets loud around you, you can hear it really well. And then once that kind of peters out, you can go right back to listening to your music. Pretty soon I'm going to be doing the summer run series on Long Island where you go to a lot of uh, local parks and they have all distant, different distant races. They have uh, 5Ks, 10Ks, 5 mile races, so it's kind of a mix of things. So I'll get to do a lot of race testing with some of the shoes I have behind me here and do some uh, good comparisons and see how all these shoes stack up over those many different distances of races. So that's pretty much all I had for today. I just wanted to give a, a recap on my race. Uh, if you have any questions or want more info about how things went, uh, feel free to leave a message in the comments. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video.